This program is brought to you by BASF, the chemical company. Hey, welcome to Stuff to Blow Your Kid's Mind. My name is Robert Lamb. And my name is Julie Douglas, and today we are talking about the scale of the universe. When you look up into the night sky, everything up there looks very small, and the world around us looks huge. I mean, just think about the scale of the planet. Most of us haven't explored half of it, much less all of it. So in today's experiment, we are going to take household items and we are going to use those to illustrate the relative size and scale of the objects in our solar system. And these are household items that you can find in your pantry. In fact, we are going to start with a black peppercorn. This is what you put in your pepper grinder. And this actually represents the Earth. All right, now let's move out to the largest planet in our solar system and work our way down to the smallest. The largest is Jupiter, and it would be represented by a gumball. And then you have Saturn in the form of a hazelnut. Uranus and Neptune would be coffee beans. Venus, the size of a green peppercorn, slightly larger than our black peppercorn Earth over here. And Mars and Neptune would be mere pinheads. Uh, but we are missing one really important item, a huge item. That's right. This is the solar system after all, so we need something to represent the sun. And that would be a bowling ball. As you can see, this dwarfs everything else on the table. This is the massive object at the center of our solar system that binds everything else with its gravity. So let's roll our sun over here, put it up against our yardstick, and we are now going to measure the distance between the sun and the outermost planet, Neptune. Yes, this is a yardstick, yard in length, but we would need a thousand of these end to end to illustrate exactly uh, how far it would be from our bowling ball shaped sun to our pinhead planet here. That's more than half of a mile. And just to give you another good idea of the scale of the universe here, we're going to take a stroll on the surface of the Earth and the surface of the Sun. If you were to walk all the way around the Earth at an average human walking speed of three miles per hour, it would take you a little less than a year. That's right, because you are covering the distance of about 25,000 miles. But in comparison, here in the Sun, you're going to cover the distance of 27.1 million miles. So a stroll around the Sun would take you about 100 years, a solid century of walking. That's a lot. So the next time you look into the night sky and you think how small everything looks up there and think how big everything seems around you here on Earth, just remember that it's actually the other way around. Now that we've discussed the relative sizes that are present in our solar system and the distances, let's talk about how we can actually measure those distances. But in order to do that, we should look back about 300 years ago in history. Right, let's meet a man by the name of Johannes Kepler. Now Kepler looked at our solar system the way you might look at a racetrack. You know that the inside lanes on a racetrack cover less distance than the outside lanes and it takes more time to travel around that outside lane than it does the inner lane. So he was able to look at the solar system and see which planets took the longest, and those planets are, uh, of course, going to be farther away from the sun, and the ones that take less amount of time are closer in. And although he couldn't measure the distance in kilometers, he could figure out relative distances. For instance, he could look at Mars and say, you know what, that is about one and a half times further from the sun than the Earth is. Another old-timey method that we had uh, to figure out exactly how far planets are from one another in our solar system uh, is something called the parallax method, and That's it right. involves your finger. You can do this at home if you'd like. Just close one eye, open it, close the other one, and keep doing this back and forth, and you're going to see that it appears that your finger seems to be moving just a little bit. And that's because you have an angle from each eye that's different, and that's separated by a couple of inches. There was another astronomer by the name of Giovanni Cassini, who in the 17th century said, I'm going to take this idea and I'm going to apply it geographically. So what if I could put one eyeball here in Paris, another in South America, and everybody looks up at the night sky at Mars, and he takes a little bit of geometry and he figures out the relative distance from Mars to the Sun, and he comes up with a figure that's only 7% off of our more precise measurements. A more modern method that we have is to actually send radar waves out into the solar system, let them bounce off of another planet and return to us. We know how fast those waves travel, so we can just time them and in order to figure out exactly how far they have traveled. Okay, so we've talked about this journey around the solar system and the relative distances. Let's see what happens when we exit our system and go into the Milky Way. Wow, a journey into interstellar space? Is that even possible? Well, not for you and me, but for something called Voyager 1, it could happen pretty soon. Now, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2, these are robotic probes that we launched into space in 1977. And ever since that point, these puppies have been exploring the solar system, beaming back all sorts of valuable information about other planets to Earth. 
information like volcanic activity on Mars and electromagnetic fields on other planets. But before we can talk about what it's like to exit a solar system and go into another tour into interstellar space, let's talk about the Sun. The Sun is the center of heat and energy and light in our solar system. And I want you to think of it as a campfire out in the middle of a dark field. All right, our planets are huddled around that campfire for uh, warmth and energy. And the farther you travel away from that campfire, the colder and darker it gets until you reach the very limits of that fire's influence. And that is where we find Voyager 1 about to cross what we call the heliopause. So right, helio, sun, pause, a stopping before starting again. It's this outermost bubble that Voyager 1 is in and will soon exit out into interstellar space. So Voyager 1 is leaving the influence of our own sun and it's about to traverse this vast emptiness till eventually it enters the influence of a distant star. So. Researchers and scientists say that this could occur anywhere from, say, today to two years from now. And what's really cool about that is sooner than later, we're going to have a bunch of really great data about this vast expanse, this final frontier of our galaxy. So if you think back to our experiment, we saw just how small the Earth is compared to the rest of the solar system. And now we've seen that our solar system is also really tiny compared to the vastness of our universe. This program is brought to you by BASF, the chemical company.